Imagine a place where students use media, creativity, communication, and critical thinking to make stories come to life. A place where authentic audiences are enlightened by the kids who live there. Hawk Media Productions at Kealakehe Intermediate School, located in Kona, Hawaii, is an example of that place where students strive daily for the summit. From school broadcasts, Hiki No Stories, community spotlights, and now podcasts, Hawk Media Productions hopes to inspire other schools to get involved in meaningful learning in the community and the world. Believe it or not, all schools have the students, teachers, and community partners to be the spark for what school could be in Hawaii. That I care about um, their passions and their interests, that I want to spark their curiosity, and uh, I want to empower them to find out whatever it is that they, what impacts they feel they can make um, on this world. So simply, a teacher leader is not a boss. Uh, it's not a, they're not a supervisor um, peer, and they invite others on journeys. Really make real devices and real things that would make a difference in the world. You know, you should be ingrained in what you're learning and don't be in the classroom. Let's go places. Let's go, you know, out in the field and interview people and talk to people. And so that kind of started change. You are listening to the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast. Here's your host, Josh Rapoon. Hey, everybody. This is the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast. I'm your host, Josh Rapoon. Today, we're here with Christy Federley, who has flown over from the island of Maui. Christy, thank you for being with us today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. So the beginning, part one, if you will, of these episodes that we do typically uh, kind of revolves around biography. So Mm -hmm. I want to dive into that real quick here. So it seems like you were tracking towards medical school way, way back um, at the end of your high school years. Talk Mm -hmm. to me about why medical school and what was going on at that point. Um, I was pretty determined that I was going to be a doctor by the time I was 30. That was my goal. Um, I don't know, some arbitrary goal, I think. Nobody in my family at that point was in medicine. Um, But to me, it felt like a prestigious career. Um, So I had, you know, I was doing college classes while I was in high school and a lot of anatomy, physiology, and biology and sciences. And I was just pretty motivated to go that way. Cool. And so not too long after that, you met a very non-traditional political science slash government a teacher named Mr. Berg. Am I saying his last name correctly? Absolutely, yes. So it sounds like Mr. Berg is a very special person in your life. So yeah. talk to us about him and what his influence was on you. So um, I didn't necessarily like my my high school that I went to. It was a pretty traditional, they, they were trying to do project-based learning. It was right around the Grants Foundation kind of started. Um, but there was a lot of missteps, I think, and a lot of tracking for students. And I was kind of a punky kid. Mm. And so, you know, my teachers were like, ah, you know what? You're probably not going to go to college, even though I was taking college classes. I had, you know, bright colored hair and whatever. I saw a photo of you online uh, <laughs> where half of your face is painted and yeah. the other half is not. Mm-hmm. That was pretty interesting. Yeah, I think that was Halloween. But yes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was I had to take this government class and uh, I was really resistant to have to take a class at the high school campus because most of my classes were at the local community college. And, you know, I walk into this room and there's posters and all of these art projects on the wall and old Saturday Night Live footage is playing on the TV. Wow. And Mr. Berg is like leaning up against a file cabinet, drinking this big cup of coffee and whistling. And I'm like, what is this guy doing? And he kind of had a reputation for being a crazy teacher. And I was like, okay, here we go. I have to take this class. But through that class, I mean, it was right around election year. Um, You know, Clinton came to our town and it was this big deal, but we were really part of the process. He taught us how to lobby and how to have your own political opinion, which didn't happen in classes before that. But he was really focused on not just teaching the textbook, which I, you know, had been pretty successful with, you know, figuring that game out. But he was really kind of part of this whole, you know, you should be ingrained in what you're learning and Mm -hmm. don't be in the classroom. Let's go places. Let's go, you know, out in the field and interview people and talk to people. And so that kind of started to change not only my, um, like comfortability in high school because the other teachers kind of dismissed me. Um, But it kind of made me feel a little bit like maybe teaching was where I wanted to go because he had such just a positive impact on my like critical thinking and, and process in education that 
like you can actually dive into information, that it's not just a textbook. So I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the critical thinking thing, because yeah. you made a note of that in your, mm-hmm. in your biographic material. What are the ways that he actually helped you to become a better critical thinker or a deeper critical thinker or more critical right. critical thinker? Yeah, I'm, I think it was he questions, right? Instead of giving you information, he would pose questions in class. We would have, I mean, what I know now as an educator at Socratic seminars that, you know, we didn't do that back then, you know, 20 years ago, which seems like a long time ago. But, um, you know, he would pose questions. And instead of giving us the answer or telling us we were right or wrong, he would make us do research and talk to people and figure it out. And so we kind of built that understanding of this is a way you can learn Mm -hmm. instead of here's the book, here's your test, you know, fill out your bubbles or whatever. And so because we were, you know, interviewing people and we, you know, went to the government capitol buildings and we were lobbying for things, like we had to really know what we were talking about, which I think really pushed us to want to do more. Sounds like he was pushing you to learn how to ask good questions. Yeah, for sure. And that was coming out in the interviews that you were doing. You had to pose the questions. You have to learn how to pose those questions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So... I taught history for a long time, Christy. I taught history for 17 years. And increasingly over that time, I switched or flipped from being a history teacher who delivered a lot of information Mm -hmm. to a history teacher who wanted my students to be historians. Mm -hmm. That's a very different thing. Um, it, It felt to me as I was reading through this material about Mr. Berg that he was wanting you to be something. Mm -hmm. And since he was teaching government. So what exactly did he want you to be? I mean, he wanted us to be a part of our community and to be a citizen and to really know what that meant, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of just, yes, you know, I live here. This is the box that I check. But to be an advocate, like he he talked a lot about, you know, whatever you believe in, right? Whatever side you're on, you want to advocate for that side and to really understand what you're doing. Right. One of the things that I'm really curious about because of the way that you describe Mr. Berg and the way you first saw him in his classroom is I'm curious about his use of space, of physical space. Mm -hmm. Was it different in the class? Did he did he treat space differently in his government political science class? Yeah, absolutely. You know, what was it like? What did it look like? You could never figure out where the front of the room was, right? Mm. Which is something that I always tried to to do in my classes, too. You would walk in, and sometimes it was, where is Mr. Berg? Where is he hiding? I mean, he was a very tall, older man, so he wasn't... Hard to miss. Yeah, yeah. he was hard to miss, but you, it, you always had to figure out where it was going in the classes. The desks were never the same. You know, it, it was always evolving and changing based on what we were doing that day. Right. Yeah. So... I'm going to switch a little bit and talk about your experience at university. Um, In what ways did your university training train you to be an innovator? And I'm referencing some things that you sent me about project-based learning, Mm -hmm. about service learning, about the experiential learning. So how did university help you to become more innovative or be a more innovative thinker? Yeah, I think so. I went to um, Pacific Lutheran University, which is a private, small university in Washington, and You know, initially, I didn't know what I was going for. I was like, oh, maybe political science, maybe education, maybe art, maybe something. But kind of started in the education path and and quickly realized that I was not going to learn how to be a traditional teacher. Like, they were very focused on, you know, students are growing and changing and schools should be changing. And even in the way that they presented classes, it wasn't a lecturer in the front, right? We had very small classes and it was ingrained that, we are going to change what schools look like. Like Mm -hmm. when you become a teacher and you graduate from this university, you are going to lead and innovate and change what schools should be. And I mean, that was like our first semester of classes was take everything you think you know about school and throw it away because it is going to be different. Um, And so, you know, we learned then um, service learning was kind of a big thing and project-based learning was coming about as kind of a reform movement. And so our classes were very integrated in, this is how you do this. Mm. This is how you walk into a school and you're going to be the only one doing it because all of the other teachers are so formally trained. You're going to walk in and you're going to say, this is what we need to do. Right. And and so I took those pieces um, and my first year teaching, I actually was a small school teacher leader and said, this is what we're doing. And I led and worked with Learn and Serve America and started bringing in some of those PBL pieces and service learning and showing them, you know, it was a very rural, urban, sorry, urban school. And there was a lot of gang issues. And, and I said, we're going to take these kids and we're going to go to the food bank and we're going to go do these experiences and show them how that applies to math and science and all these pieces. Mm. Um, and so, 
you know, through my student teaching and everything, it was very much ingrained that, you know, as a student coming from the school, you were going to drive and innovate change. You know, Christy, there was a moment way, way back when, I think it was around 1996, um, I was dating someone who, uh, a woman who actually was attending the John Burns Medical School here at University of Hawaii. And we were out at dinner one night and she started talking about something called problem-based learning, mm -hmm. which is actually the foundation of mm -hmm. John Burns' approach to teaching medicine. And I was teaching at Punahou School at the time, which is a, a large private school here on Oahu. And I remember my world flipped. I just thought, wow, this is what I've been looking for. And we weren't really talking about project-based learning at that point, but problem-based learning meant a group of medical students who were focused on one patient and were coming together. Right, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Do you remember a moment where that was true for you, that you, that you a light bulb went on around project-based or experiential education, and you thought, wow, this is what I'm aligned with? Um, I think within my, my bachelor's program, so within that university, one of our first, it w I mean, it was very much aligned with problem and research and action research and, you know, take a piece that you're looking at in schools. And I, I was doing my student teaching, thankfully, in the same school that I did my first few years teaching. And so I was able to really kind of analyze the students and look at what the populations were bringing. Um, and so, which also led into my master's, but it was all aligned with, you know, how do we really transform education for students that I, I spent a lot of time working with student at risk students and students who, you know, came from gang families and what that looks like for them. Um, and so the project that I was really kind of focused on is, you know, how do you, how do you use this PBL stuff or this problem, right? So my problem that I was looking at is like, how do we really engage students Right. To think outside of, you know, they don't like coming to school. They have really, you know, ba lots of baggage they're bringing with them. Right. But how do we really push them to want to dive into education? And right. so once I started kind of doing some research and and then pulling the kids out, I did small after school groups and I, I told the kids, come, it's a safe space. Let's talk about what's going on in the world and what impact can you make? And I mean, I had students that, you know, were from opposing gangs that knew they could come in. They told me their stories and we figured out like, what pieces can we now look at what the community need is, wow. right, and start to really address that need. And once the kids started getting engaged and realizing that regardless of what their baggage was, that they could make a difference, um, that's when I was like, oh, you know what? There's something to this. Wow, like, that's, this can work. That's awesome. Hey, everybody, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to be talking to Christy about her first experiences coming out of university and into being a teacher in a school. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Within a generation of 25 years, Kamehameha Schools sees a thriving Lahui where our learners achieve post-secondary and educational success. To this end, Kamehameha Schools is proud to share Halau Inana Makapa'akea, an innovation and collaboration space where Native Hawaiian learners converge as a new generation of OEV leaders, innovators, indigipreneurs, and entrepreneurs. The Halau will host and curate various programs, events, and activities that foster OEV leadership development, creative thinking, and problem-solving, innovation, prototyping, and incubation. Hey everybody, we're back. We're with Christy Federley. She's the school director or site director mm -hmm. at Hawaii Technology Academy, which is a charter school that has uh, seven campuses on four islands, if I've got my facts straight, right? Mm -hmm. We'll cover that in a sec. So Christy, tell me about coming out of um, teacher prep at university and into your first job. It sounds like I know you've sort of described it already, but it sounds like it was actually pretty tough for you coming out yeah. initially. It was, um, the student population was was a challenging group. Um, it was right outside of a military base. There was lots Where of- Where was this? Um, in Tacoma, Washington. Oh, right, okay. Um, okay. And so, you know, there was lots of students that would just kind of get dropped there that were from, you know, different backgrounds and lots of gang um, issues and things like that. I was fortunate that- um, the teacher that was my mentor teacher, actually, I she left the school, so I moved right into the position that I did all my student teaching for. Right. So in a matter of being overly prepared, I was definitely paper prepared, right, right. for what I was walking into. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, the you know, the first year, I, I definitely noticed that, that, you know, there were students that just were not, their needs were not being met. Like, they were playing the game of school. They were showing up. Um, and so, you know, I kind of took some of that background from my 
my education program to really drive change and started, um, pulled in some of the Learn and Serve America pieces. I started working with the Coalition of Essential Schools Northwest. Yeah, that was what I was going to ask you about yeah. next is the um, coalition. Yeah. And Tell us about that. Yeah. Too. And yeah. so my first step was to, to build an advisory program because they didn't really have they had a homeroom where you checked in and then you went on with your life. Um, right. But these students had just so much baggage for, from family stuff and poverty that we needed a place for them to just connect with teachers in a different way. Um, and so the Coalition of Essential Schools was really kind of trying to drive that, you know, senior projects and advisory model at that point. So I started working a lot with them and pulling in, um, you know, doing a lot of professional development aligned with you know, what advisory could be for schools and where that's kind of a starting point to start to build that connection of schools could be a little bit different. We can do things a little bit differently. And then with the Learn and Serve America, I actually worked with the faculty first, my first year, um, and we did a whole service learning project with the teachers first mm -hmm. um, so that they could see authentically what this looks like um, and then started pulling it in for classrooms. The teachers actually did a full exhibition, which um, was amazing. And then they, they saw, you know, their own intrinsic motivation to do that and then what that could look like for kids. Right. I actually did my master's in um, service learning. I got a master's in ed foundations at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. But my, my focus was on service learning and my master's thesis was on service learning. I actually wrote my thesis about the argument that had taken over the service learning movement about whether it should be hyphenated or not. Oh, wow. And that this was a major distraction yeah. <laughs> to what we should actually be doing in service learning instead of arguing about this hyphen. Um, so you described to me in your biographic material that you had this moment when you were a teacher where you created this sort of marketplace in India. Oh my gosh. And yeah. right. And so, so apparently this went off the rails really badly and it turned into a bit of a disaster for you. But talk to us about what happened, what you did, and then what you gained from that, from that so, experience. Yeah, so I had this amazing idea, you know, first year teacher. Of course it was amazing. It was amazing. Right? <laughs> it was the best idea ever. It involved lots of butcher paper. Um, you know, I spent the whole weekend, we were learning about um, India and Pakistan and the untouchables. And I wanted my students to experience some of that because a lot of them were kind of disconnected from the material. We had, you know, a designated book that we had to read um, for, you know, the curriculum pacing. And so I spent the whole weekend um, decorating the, the classroom in these different stations that represented, um, you know, an Indian marketplace, if you will, with, you know, temples and all of this extravagant. Right. I had different stations with art of fakes that I had created that would represent wow. and, and photo Photo booth. I mean, extraordinary amount of work. Oh my goodness, yeah. And you know, I was so excited for the kids to come in and to see, you know, this amazing marketplace. And they walk in, and there was lots of explicit words from them, and they were just like, "What is this?" And I was like heartbroken. But at the same time, you know, that's when I started to really kind of realize that it's not about me, like at all. It's not about what I want. It's not wow. about you know, I'm I love history and political science, and I, I'm a book nerd, but it's not about any of that. Right. Like it's really, and I thought that I was doing it for them. I thought that I was creating this amazing experience for them, but it, it's what I thought was amazing. Right. Right. And so that transition of, oh my gosh, it's not at all about me. It has nothing to do with what I want to teach. It has everything to do with what they need and what they, you know, what the mm -hmm. students actually are going to be able to connect with. And so that was, I think, pivotal. And I had that early in my career, so it was mm, beneficial. Yeah. yeah. And what, what happened after that? Like, can you can you remember even in the days or weeks yeah, after that? Yeah, I mean, I, I really started to just talk with the kids. You know, I had all these great plans and visions of what service learning and PBL and what that's going to look like in my classroom before I was even in the classroom, right? Mm -hmm. And so that first year, I was really trying to just implement things that I thought thought were going to be good for them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I had had conversations after school with kids, and I had these groups where I was meeting with kids that were, you know, had a lot of baggage, and I, I knew that I was making an impact there. But within my classroom, I wasn't seeing that same transformation. Right. And so, you know, I started to talk to them. I was like, hey, let's mm -hmm. sit down. Like, when they came in and they were like, what the, you know, is this? What are you doing? This is stupid. And I was like, whoa, okay, wait what is, like, what, what did I miss? Like, right. where did I miss here? Because I thought this was going to be great and amazing. And it, I had to be really vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a little challenging because I'm kind of stubborn and very set in, I know everything. And so being vulnerable with the kids and really giving them the opportunity to tell me, like, they, right. you know, they were like, yeah, we, you know, we want to learn more about the untouchables because they can relate to them. And we want to learn more about this, but this, 
butcher paper is ridiculous. Right. You know? And so it must have felt empowering to begin those discussions with them. Yeah. That you, that it was almost sort of, I would imagine it was a little bit of a high that you were excited to be having conversations with them and finding out what they cared about. Yeah. Did it feel like that? Yeah, absolutely. And I, yeah, and I, I, you know, pushing them to really be open too was a challenge. But mm-hmm. once they realized that, you know, they could connect with me and that we could change the entire pace. Like it didn't matter, you know, what my curriculum said or where we were going that, Mm. you know, tell me what they want and what they need and we'll change it. We'll throw that away and we'll try something else. Wow. Out of the mouths of babes comes the truth, which is (laughs) we don't have to go at your pace. Yeah, It's about our lives and, and the lives that we're living. Yeah. So speaking of pace, ours is moving along really fast. Um, We have to take a quick flight uh, from the mainland to Maui, um, and we're actually leaving behind a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to talk to you about, but we can't. We don't have time. So you moved to Maui, Mm -hmm. um, and you uh, had some time leading an arts-based, arts-integrated middle school program. So what was this about? And for anybody who's listening out there in in Hawaii or in the nation or in the world, what is an arts infused or arts based program? So we had this great idea, <laughs> and yeah. um, so I was with a charter school, um, and we saw a need for students. We had a lot of students coming from you know Montessori based schools and private schools that really wanted a different way to express um, their understanding and their learning. And so we paired up with the Maui Academy of Performing Arts, mm. and we utilized one of their dance studios, okay. um, actually several dance studios, and we ran a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade program through during the day. Logistically, there was lots of crazy pieces, um, but during the day we did, it was what is now a STEAM integration program. So we had we had a, an amazing science technology teacher that was showing the kids how to create, you know, um, and utilize their math concepts through technology and art. And then we had our humanities classes that were really looking at cultural pieces and literature and how do we express these stories through dance and movement. Um, And so it was a crazy year. The program lasted for a year, and then we just realized logistically we were far away from the main campus, and it just there were a lot of logistical pieces that didn't work out. Um, but the kids that were ingrained in that program for a year, I still run into them. They're like, oh, do you remember when we did this? Yeah. And it's not about what they learned, but it's what they did with what they learned. Right. Yeah. Um, everybody listening to this podcast hopefully knows that the author of the book um, that inspired this podcast, um, What School Could Be, the author is Ted Dindersmith. I actually took him to a school just down the road from HTA Maui, uh, Pomaika'i mm-hmm. Elementary, which is about 700 students, mm-hmm. elementary students, and that's an arts-integrated school as well. Mm-hmm. And we were blown away by what we saw. We, they, we, we were able to witness a piece of theater where the kids were um, dramatizing in theater the table of elements. Mm-hmm. And so each kid became an element and they had to work out that piece of theater that explained. And it was quite remarkable. Did you, did you experience that thing that happens when kids start integrating like that? Yeah, there was, there was several pieces where um, the students were... Yeah, ingrained in theater. We had an amazing movement teacher who taught them even singing and how to sing your math problems so that you can remember the equations and pieces like that where, you know, if you involve more pieces of movement and memory, then you actually remember it. Yeah, Yeah. very cool. So one more question before we go to break. Um, I want to talk a little bit. You're back in Seattle now. You've flown back from from Maui Mm -hmm. back to you're living in Seattle. Um, and you were talking in your biographic material about cognitive coaching and mentoring matters. Mm-hmm. So what is cognitive coaching and, and how did you get involved in that? Um, so when I flew back to Seattle, um, I actually I took a job as an instructional coach for a large comprehensive district just outside of Seattle. And my primary task was to um, improve math scores, which, I mean, internationally isn't that a primary task of all. Um, and so not a math teacher, also very young at that point in my career too. Um, I was working with a large group of math teachers who were also football coaches and very, wow. uh, very not receptive to, you know, a 25, 26 year old female coming in and leading the charge. Um, and right. so the, the main coaching, um, district person was like, Hey, you need to get some training. Like let's do cognitive coaching. Let's do mentoring matters. Let's kind of get you ingrained, which had I had that training when I was a leader previous, it would have been amazing, but it's really aligned with I mean, listening, right. And asking those questions to drive conversation and listening some more and kind of reframing the conversation to 
coach through and get to the end result, right? By encouraging the right kinds of questions, which is essential, right? For for our careers, yeah. And I'm imagining that that's now coming um, to fruition in the position that you hold at HTA, which is where we're going to go next yes. after our break. Very cool. Hey, everybody, stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment to talk with Christy about her position at Hawaii Technology Academy and a number of other things. We'll be right back. Purple Maya, our specialty is providing cultural based programming to learn technology and computer science. We are always looking for teachers, volunteers, and schools to partner with. But our programs aren't only for Keiki. Heard of the Purple Prize? We're accepting applications now for Kamaka Inana, a design and venture ideation program for adults interested in creating solutions that positively impact the Pai Aina. It's about shaping the way Hawaii designs for the future. Visit us at purplemaya or purpleprize.com for more info. Also, how major is this podcast? Keep up the good work, guys. Hey, everybody. We're back. We're with Christy Federley from Hawaii Technology Academy. So, Christy, we're back on Maui now in this final segment of our episode. Um, And you're now at Hawaii Technology Academy, which has seven campuses on uh, three islands, actually, I think it is, right? Maui, Hawaii Island, and Oahu. And Kauai. Oh, we do have one on Kauai Mm -hmm. now. Okay, that's great. So I have lots of questions about Hawaii Technology Academy. Um, So why, you said in your biographic material that, that once you landed at HTA, you felt more aligned in values than anywhere else. Yeah. Why? Um, So... There's something different about HTA. There's a lot of things different. But the fact that when you start at HTA, it's almost invigorating. Like, it's a huge learning curve to figure out how to do all the things that are best practiced in a blended learning environment, virtually and face-to-face, and figuring those pieces out. But also, there's this whole push to be a lifelong learner. Like, Mm -hmm. our faculty is amazing. And so anytime we meet and collaborate, it's really pushing where we are foundationally. And everybody kind of has that same drive and momentum. Um, It can be a little exhausting at times, but it's also, it's also just invigorating. And the fact that our, you know, we're looking at how can we really align with what the students need on a constant basis. And so since that's evolving, um, how do we really meet the needs of all of our learners? And that's kind of our, at the forefront of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So instead of having a series of learner outcomes, which I know you probably have, Mm -hmm. But in, instead of focusing on the learner outcomes, you're actually focused on what the students need, mm-hmm. which flips things, right? Because then it's your job as as a leader, as a school leader, as a faculty to find out what the students need, what they want, what they care about, what mm-hmm. their purposes are. Mm-hmm. Is that that am I is that a fair statement? Yeah, absolutely. And how does that work at HDA? Like, how does that actually happen that you spend the time to find out? You know, it's interesting because we see our students face to face two times a week. But I feel like we have a strong relationship with each of our students individually. Um, we meet with families and students at the start of every school year. We sit down. We talk about what are your goals, what are your needs from both the parent and the student mm-hmm. um, across grade levels, so kindergarten to 12th grade. We also align really strongly with our core values, which isn't necessarily content related, but it's the five C's, so critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity, and character. Okay. And those are embedded across all of our disciplines. And the, It's how the students develop their student-led conferences, how they align their graduation portfolios, and then they also kind of value themselves each year, each semester, each class. Where are you at right now? Like, where are you at in character? Because that is evolving, right, and changes. And how are you feeling in communication? And so we really focus on those instead of, okay, what's your math test grade, right? What are you doing right now in science? And those lead the conversations with kids. Wow, that's super interesting. So I'm willing to bet that the term blended learning is one of those (laughs) education jargon phrases that probably drives a lot of people up a wall because they really don't know what it is, mm-hmm. or it's just very confusing to people. So here's your moment, Christy, for <laughs> everyone who's going to be listening to this podcast. What is blended learning? And so we say that we have the true blend at HTA. Okay. <laughs> and Uh-oh. so it is um, a combination, depending on grade level, of face-to-face classes, right, where the students come to one of our learning centers. They are ingrained in you know Socratic seminars and discussions and project-based learning components with their teacher, with their student peers. 
Then there's synchronized virtual classes where the students all log in. Um, right now we're using Zoom, but they log into their Zoom class. Um, they attend their class synchronously with all of their students and wow. work with their teacher. Right. And then we also have independent days where this where it's either experiential learning days, so the students are either out in the field doing field studies and community service with their teachers mm -hmm. or with their families, or they're working independently at home or in internships. We also have most... A high percentage of our juniors and seniors taking UHMC classes on, on Maui, um, wow. so that those are kind of embedded into their schedule as well. It seems like it would this this type of blended learning, this peer blended learning, would require a completely different skill set for your faculty. Yes, fair statement. Absolutely. And how do you go about getting everybody on the same page in terms of what they have to do to execute the blended learning plan? Yeah. So it starts with the fact that it's okay to fail and, okay. and to figure it out, right? Okay. That our expectations, we have, um, on Maui, we have four new faculty this year. And so it's been a bit of a learning curve because it is. Even, even teachers who come from what they think is a blended learning or from virtual programs, really trying to figure out what this looks like. Um, our teachers also have full autonomy with their courses. And so that also is, you know, great and challenging at the same time. Um, we do weekly PLCs for three hours where it's, you know, what, what are your concerns? What are you struggling with? Let's all work together and figure out how to fix that and how to solve that problem. Right. And so there's a lot of teacher support. Um, and then there's a lot of just built in, um, coaching, right. And questioning. Right. And we have, you know, we have a coach that works with all teachers across all islands independently. Each site director coaches faculty. They work together. They have a new teacher mentoring program. So there's lots of just support um, because it is a huge learning curve. I was a teacher at HTA for four years. And so I, I know, you know, like creating your classes and diving in and, and rethinking what best practice looks like in this model is challenging and it takes work. Mm -hmm. Besides the Zoom feature, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, and I'm referencing ed tech right now, yeah. education technology, besides the Zoom feature where students are Zooming in mm -hmm. a couple times a week and that, can you give me another specific example of where technology comes into play in the service mm -hmm. of individualized, personalized learning? Right. Um, so within our, we have a um, our education platform, our curriculum platform, if you will. Um, the teachers also differentiate for every student based on where they're at. And you can you know, they create their content and upload it into the platform. And so that's a component, right? In a lot of ways, I think when we say Hawaii Technology Academy, that's kind of a misdemeanor because the students are using the technology, yeah? yeah. But it isn't necessarily, I think we have a lot of growth in that area of how are they then using it in the field? You know, we have chemistry and science classes that use technology. We have students that, you know, we have several students in internships that are doing troubleshooting for our technology and trying to wow. figure out like That's real th world. there's a call in the parents can call into the internship group and say hey I, you know I can't log into this what do I do and so wow. I mean there's a lot of real world pieces that we're still evolving I think as I mean right yeah right. as we grow That's very cool um, Christy I reached out to one of your colleagues um, who's now on the mainland mm -hmm. her name is Jen Francis and I asked her to give me a couple of questions to ask you okay. um, today. And, and she was super excited and immediately fired back on Facebook Messenger um, her <laughs> question. So the first one that she wanted me to ask you is, what's the value add of charter schools in Hawaii? Yeah, I think it's the opportunity to do, do things differently. I think... Um, you know, on Maui, there's two charter schools. And beyond that, there's, you know, the traditional DOE schools and private schools. I think we have the flexibility and the autonomy to, to look at what works for kids and create programs aligned with that. Mm -hmm. And I, so for a second, I want you to step into a hypothetical situation. Okay. So let's say that you're at kind of a, a parent meeting mm -hmm. and the, the two sets of parents who are in the room, and there's also educators and education leaders and policymakers, and those two sets are charter school parents and mm -hmm. community, and the other is regular mm -hmm. public school, and they're angry at each other mm -hmm. as they so often are mm -hmm. on the mainland. Mm -hmm. What do you say to them? Well, as a traditional DOE parent and a charter school leader, <laughs> right. yeah, which yeah. I'm both, yeah. um, I, you know, I think it's, it has to be what's, what works for kids, right? right? Like my own students go to the traditional DOE and, and there's pieces and components of both that can work really, really well. Right. Within our program, it really takes um, the self-direction, right? And it takes the learning coach, which is our parents, to really be actively involved especially in the kindergarten through middle school level. And so that might not be the right fit, right? right? Same as the traditional school, right? 
as charter schools, we are only trying to do what's best for kids, same as traditional schools. The difference is, is we have a little bit more autonomy in terms of how we do that. Right. Yeah. It's just such a mystery to me why everybody seems to come out of their foxholes with their weapons drawn and that they start shooting at each other. But I'm also very grateful that in Hawaii, we have very collegial conversations going on right. between public, private, and charter. Right, and, and we have an amazing charter commission. I think that's also a difference. That's because been a key other difference. Other states are, you know, it's looser, and there's more business-run charter schools, whereas, you right. know, that, that foundation is different here. And we have conversations underway between the charter commission and the Board of Education of mm -hmm. the Public Schools and also the Hawaii Association of Independent Schools, So the, mm -hmm. and also with, um, with homeschooled mm -hmm. uh, networks of parents and other communities as well. And I, I'm very excited about how that's playing out here in Hawaii. Right. Um, the other question that Jen wanted me to ask you um, is what... I know the Hawaii Technology Academy, by definition, is doing lots of things at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so it's, very vi it's a very vibrant and innovative, uh, innovation-driven community. Mm -hmm. But what specific initiatives are you working on for the future now that haven't even arrived yet? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Yeah. Hopefully my teachers aren't Thank listening. Thank you, Jen, no, for that great question. <laughs> um, I think... <laughs> Maybe she's watching on right? Facebook Live, yeah. <laughs> what I'm most excited about is really moving away from traditional grading practices and moving into mastery concepts and really helping the students align with growth mindset in terms of that, you know, students are still pretty stuck on that grade. And so I think helping to push and drive that conversation is kind of our evolution in the future. And that that's actually one of the other questions that I wanted to ask you is about Strive High and about testing and the testing culture and that um, there is an apparent movement underway, which is gaining some momentum to limit it as a metric of success for mm -hmm. students. So at HTA, across all of HTA, what are those conversations like about yeah. what those, what the, the other type of assessments are? Yeah, um, and so looking at building critical thinking and communication, like that's not something you can assess, right, on a it's difficult test yeah right bit, you can't right? actually it's impossible yeah. on a test and, like that yeah. and so because those are some of our foundational values right? right we're looking at even how do students defend how they know what they know right building in de senior defense and middle school defenses so that they can pull from their internships and their community service pieces and really have that conversation like we want our students to be able to advocate for what they're ready to do next Right. right. And so I think that that's kind of the evolution of of what we want to start pulling in in the midst of all of our other pieces. But it kind of pulls together. Right. I mean, our report cards are aligned with the core values as they are right now. It's just on the other side of the grades. Right. Right. And it shows their spectrum of where they're at in terms of from a teacher, a parent and a student evaluation um, so that they can kind of start to identify where their growth is mm -hmm. um, and where they, they choose to be in the next year or hope to be in the next year. And so I think pulling that into more of the focus and starting to, to kind of dissolve the, the right. grades. Yeah. We're, we're going to be in that in-between period for a while. Oh, I know. We're on the one side of the sheet are, are the grades, and on the other side of the sheet is those other types of assessments that are more um, uh, qualitative, yeah. that, that are more character and mm -hmm. what you know and what you can do and who you are as a right. person, right? right. So I want to, we, we're coming to the end already. Amazing how fast this goes by, right? Yeah. Um, so I want to end, Christy, by talking about something that's just really got me thinking. And I'm just kind of blown away by the fact that this has even happened. In my lifetime of paying attention to education, which is more than 40 years now, I never thought I would live long enough to see something like a 2030 promise plan mm -hmm. from our Department of Education. Mm -hmm. That even the word promise would come in to the conversation instead of an emphasis on strategy or strategic mm -hmm. plans. We're talking about promises to students. Um, and I'm, I'm very moved by this document about what we are potentially promising our kids. And I'm referencing a kid named Sky mm -hmm. that you referenced in your biographic material who comes from Hana mm -hmm. twice yeah. a week, which is a basically a two hour drive, mm -hmm. right? Almost mm -hmm. each way. Yeah. Um, and I'm wanting to ask you about what promises are you and your education community making to your students and to your parents and your school community? Yeah, um, and so because we we differentiate, right, for every kid, that promise looks different. 
right? right? And so there's students that you know want to do internships and want to go into a mechanic trade program, and then there's students that um, you know are Harvard bound or you know Ivy League and want to go that direction, you know. And there's students that know they're going to go into tourism, and so our focus is and our promise is is okay. Each individual student, what is your goal? And if that changes, that's right. great. But how are we going to get you there? And how can we build in as many real life, authentic experiences as we can wow. along the way with us so that when you graduate or if you leave in eighth grade and you go to a different high school, that you're prepared for that, mm. right? And so it, it changes per student. If I'm thinking as a student about coming into your school and you're saying that you're committed or you're promising me a lots of authentic experiences, you've really got my attention, which yeah. is a really cool thing. So Christy, I want to end by blending two questions together at the same time. I, I want in every podcast uh, episode to end by asking you what school could be, since that's the inspiration for the podcast. But I'm going to blend it with another question that I wanted to ask you. Um, let's return to Mr. Burke. Mm -hmm. And if, if he was in the room right now with us, and we were all kind of feeling vulnerable and <laughs> right here in front of Facebook Live, and we're willing to put our feelings out here. Um, what would you say to him mm -hmm. if he were here? Thank you for seeing me. And what was it that he saw? Um, I'm going to get emotional now. <laughs> I understand. That's okay. I have a similar person in my life. His name is Paul Dockberry. He passed away a couple of years ago, but he was my teacher at Punahou School. And he's the one person who really understood how I learned. Mm -hmm. And so he made the conditions possible for me to succeed because I was such a hands-on learner. And um, it was a fiction and film class and he wanted us to do a final film and I went absolutely nuts and did a whole full-on production. And so here we are in this podcast 45 years later. It's like, hello, this yeah. is what Josh wanted to do. So he yeah. means the same thing to me that Mr. Berg means to you and that's why I brought it up. So what, what, would, what, what did he see yeah. in you? Um, I mean, I, I was struggling in high school and I was trying to figure out who I wanted to be. Yeah. And I think the fact that he pushed me, you know, and he didn't dismiss me because I was a punky kid, you know, mm -hmm. I was kind of a handful, you know, um, but he saw me and he challenged me. And I think he saw every kid, you know, he unfortunately he did pass away a couple years ago too. Um, but there's this whole Facebook group of people who like supported him wow, really? and he changed lots of kids' lives. Right. And I don't even think he knew that he did it, you know? I invited him to my, you know, graduations along the way and sent him invites and, um, but I think the fact that he, he didn't, he didn't care. You know what I mean? Like he wanted kids to really, I mean, he did care too much, but he didn't care about what he had to do, right. right? About what his job title was. Like he wanted kids to really push themselves and to figure out who they were. And it was senior year, right? And so it's junior wow. and senior Even year is like amazing. the worst. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, so I, I always carry that with me, you know, and that's why I became a teacher. I was, yeah, you know, right. pre-med and all that. I think it's I think it's absolutely awesome to end an episode talking about somebody who sees students as a bundle of potentials rather than a series of deficits absolutely. that needs to be fixed. So, Christy Federley, site director at uh, Hawaii Technology Academy on Maui. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Coming up next on the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast, Sandy Camelli. Director of the Na Kumu Alakai Teacher Leader Academy. Find the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher, as well as at mltsinhawaii.com. Join the ongoing conversation across social media. Look for Most Likely to Succeed in Hawaii on Facebook, at MLTS in Hawaii on Instagram, and at MLTS and Hawaii on Twitter. Tag your posts with hashtag what school could be, hashtag deeper learning, hashtag edchat, and hashtag education. We want to hear from you. Send your comments, questions, and feedback to mltsinhawaii at gmail.com or direct message us on Twitter at MLTS in Hawaii. Our next interviews will be recorded on Saturday, January 25th starting at 9 a.m. Hawaii time. Find us at the Most Likely to Succeed in Hawaii Facebook page. Video of each interview will also be available on demand on YouTube. 
look for what school could be in Hawaii playlist on our most likely to succeed in Hawaii channel. If you love this podcast series, we would really appreciate a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. It's the best way to help us reach a wider audience of innovative educators. And please feel free to share this series with colleagues, friends, and family. Your host is Josh Rapoon. Our technical producer and podcast consultant is Ryan Ozawa. Post-production is by Hawk Media Productions, the digital media program at Kealakehe Intermediate School. Special thanks to photo and video contributor for our October episodes, Matthew Tong, a media and English teacher at Stevenson's Intermediate School. And a huge shout out to Ted Dintersmith, author of the book, What School Could Be, an education change agent. Now, off to your next education adventure. Class dismissed.